Thank you. And then I just like want to make sure that everybody knows that tonight we're hearing from Chris Peter and he's our research coordinator here. And he joined our staff about two and a half years ago. And before that, he worked for 10 years at the Jackson x ray Lab at University of New Hampshire. So Chris is going to tell you a little bit about our research programs. Um, we have done this in the past where we have our staff present to the stewards sort of a brief presentation of what they're up to. And I think it's a great way for you feel, to feel connected to the work that you support. And so you get like a nice understanding of um, all the parts of our mission. So we had Anna, and we'll have Chris, and I'll work with Deb and everybody else to see who you want to hear from next. But I've already given my staff a heads up that this year would really like to make sure that all of them have a chance to come and interact with you at uh, one of these meetings this year. So Chris, I don't, I, I think you can square, share your own screen if you'd like to, right? Because you're co-hosting too. But if you need any help, let me know. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for um, having me. Um, I was joking when um, when Corey and Deb asked me to present tonight, I joked to Anna, I was like, well, you must have done too good of a job because now they, they want to hear more about research, which is which is great. Um, but you, guys, you guys really support us in, in many ways with helping with grant administration, um, helping with raising funds to support the reserve and research, and we partner on some outreach events and materials. So it's just greater to get a great connection at Great Bay. I just used great three times in the same sentence. Perfect. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, won't be able to see everyone's faces anymore. But um, as a true scientist, I'm going to present in PowerPoint, which is our trademark. Um, so I was asked to give like a, an overview on um, the research and monitoring from this year. And I didn't want to just jump into it without acknowledging it's not just me, it's our staff, it's our research assistant, Amanda, it's Anna, our, our fabulous new fellow. Um, it's also the collaboration with, with Rachel in the, in the stewardship sector, um, with Kelly in education, Melissa, a volunteer, um, and also Corey and then hopefully the new CTP. Just it's not just one person, people. And it's also, oops, sorry for that. It's also many organizations too. So we have um, a lot of great local partners, including Steward, the UNH. We have a lot of good national partners as well. Um, sorry for my internet kind of goes in and out, but um, hopefully it's not so super bad. And uh, I'm going to do like an overview snapshot. So if you have any questions about like terms you never heard of before, um, feel free to interrupt me or just Why can't you see it? Google it. <laughs> um, so you be able to see it. I'm getting Sorry. a little bit of feedback here, but it's okay. Um, so before I jump into research, just wanted to talk about monitoring, which is the backbone bone of research. Um, and it's kind of in two different categories, uh, water quality and, and biological. And we've been doing water quality monitoring for the last three decades in Great Bay at all these green dots um, here. And that includes physical parameters like uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, chemical parameters like nutrient data and salinity. And we also track weather um, to help vet if anything crazy goes on like that Mother's Day flood and I think it was 2006 where the bay went completely fresh for about a week. Um, so those are three components. Um, oh yeah, and I have some good pictures to, to show that. Um, that's a weather station about five years ago before I took this job, uh, before um, winters became pathetic and we had you know three feet of snow on the ground. Um, so I kind of yearned for those days after uh, coming from cross country skiing between two Zoom meetings today. So I'm uh, hoping for more of those winters. Um, moving on, we do a lot of uh, habitat monitoring. We're kind of a hub for salt marsh monitoring research. And we have three sites around the bay and, and an extra site by Nature Conservancy on the western side. And we've been tracking that for about a decade now, looking at the plant community and the pore water and the elevation and the, and the tide levels, a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, we started doing some new monitoring um, with DNA monitoring, um, looking basically just taking a water sample and uh, from a boat and then bring it to lab, filtering it, extracting it, and sequencing it and seeing what type of species we get. It could be you know, fish species, it could be a diatom, it could be anything. That's a pretty interesting thing about this um, new technique and I know you guys have thrown some support to that too and I'm going to dive into it a little bit more later. Chris, I'm going to stop you there for a sec. Sure. Is, uh, have you discovered any new species um, I know you weren't there 10 years ago, but species that weren't around 10 years ago that 
may be a result of some warming or changes in the water quality? Yeah, we, um, the one that kind of sticks out is, is a lionfish. And if you are familiar with that fish, it's been migrating up from the Caribbean up to Florida. And I think it's been even reported up into Massachusetts. Now, we're not quite sure if it's an actual, you know, lionfish. I mean, the sequence has been tracked and, and verified, but whether it's actually migrated here and shed DNA or it was some or some contamination from a restaurant or from a boat. So that's kind of an interesting one because they are migrating up northward. So it, it can be used to track new species to the area, invasive species, rare species. Um, so that's the one that really sticks out. Um, yeah, I'll move on. I'll dive into DNA a little bit more later too. So we also track macroalgae with uh, participating with UNH um, around the bay because you know it, they, it does um, alter with different nutrient loads. So you expect these phyto, um, these photosynthetic organisms like seaweed and uh, phytoplankton and, and, and seagrass is to, to change with diff different inputs of nutrients. So that's uh, infrastructure month we also do. Um, and lastly, we've been getting into crabs, um, intertidal crabs. Uh, we looked at that um, one year because there's a couple of species coming up from the south. And we're also looking at horseshoe crabs. And I know that's a misnomer, but I just decided to lump it together to really track those populations. And these are all joint efforts as well. Um, now I'm going to jump into this merry-go-round of research and um, the forefront is, is how, how marshes are doing in, in faring to sea level rise from climate change. And I'm hoping to dive into this a lot more, well not a lot more, but within like, you know, two or three minutes more at the end of this presentation. But I know um, if I don't want to take up too much time if people have dinner and, you know, there's a football game on tonight as well. But uh, it's a priority and we've just come up with some very interesting results over the last two years uh, working with the university and, and a couple of other reserves around the country. Um, and I'll save that for a little bit later as a teaser. Um, on that same theme, we've researched um, this new experimental technique to help restore marshes um, because they are drowning because of sea level rise. So one of the techniques is to add a thin layer of uh, placement of sediment and that can be two to six inches. And the way that marshes accrete, they usually accrete about two millimeters a year. So that's about you know, 20 to 60 years of, of uh, accretion that we just plop down there once. And that can help make these marshes more resilient to drowning. Um, I guess the main point here is how, how much is, does this impact the vegetation? And after just one growing season, so from April to like August, you can see there's a lot of good regrowth. And this is in the high, um, sediment plot. There was um, a thin one with like a couple inches and there's a thicker one with um, you know like five or six inches. So this is a thicker one and we saw that effect around the country. So it's good to see the, the impact to the plant community was only temporary. Um, like I mentioned with crabs, there are lots of crabs <laughs> that are coming into New Hampshire and they all have these really um, uninteresting names like green crabs or blue crabs or purple crabs or fiddler crabs, um, which is more interesting. But from Southern New England, there are these um, fiddler crabs and purple marsh crabs, both burrow. And one crab actually clips marsh plants. So they've been associated with marsh destruction and marsh loss. On the top left, you can see this low marsh plot in Rhode Island that's lush. And then four years later, it's barren um, and, and riddled with burrows. So we're kind of looking to the future and seeing some of these species. I caught a couple of them actually the last couple of years. So I wanna start a, a monitoring program and kind of connect the dots and, and hopefully um, you know, get a first sign of these and, and, put, and have some management options too if they do come in, or I should say when they do come in. Um, and we're also seeing blue crabs come in too and they can have an effect on uh, juvenile lobsters and, and, and other shellfish. Uh, a great segue. Are the blue claw, are the blue crabs, the blue claw crabs, the ones that are they're actually edible? They, uh, they come out of the Chesapeake, and um, they're quite popular as far as uh, sushi and things like that. Is I think they're called spider rolls or something. Is is that the same crab we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, they're delicious, <laughs> and uh, you know Anna's from Chesapeake Bay Bay region, and yeah, they are. 
they're delicious. They're also quite aggressive too. Um, and it can have an impact on other, other organisms. And we've caught a handful, maybe like, uh, I think one this year I saw and one like a couple years ago. And then in Wells, there was, they found 50 in, in a salt marsh up there. So wow. they're up here. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Whether they can survive the winters is, is a different story, but our winters, as you guys know, are getting warmer and, and less um, iced over. Yeah, you guys are making me hungry now talking about <laughs> blue crab. <laughs> um, segwaying into, into a shellfish, uh, we've been doing some work with the Nature Conservancy on um, oyster recruitment. And this is a big pile of uh, spat on shells, so baby oysters that are cult um, cultivated at UNH at Jackson Lab, and they just dump them in the water. And some years they get a lot of good success, and some years they get zero success. And one of the things that we were thinking of was predation. You, you put a lot of um, good edible food out there, you know, susceptible baby oysters out there, a lot of predators are gonna come. So we kind of piloted um, caging uh, shells with spat on them to, to provide like a refuge from predators like this oyster drill on the on the top left uh, crabs also will munch on them too we had preliminary results so we're hoping to really dive in more in a later but um you know, there was a little reduction in in crab predation but the oyster drills were were small enough to get through these cages so um, we're just trying to get a little bit more insight on to improve oyster restoration in great bay um Chris, moving on to, sure uh, uh those oyster drills i've never you know i've been grow in these um, cages for the last five or six summers off the dock here. I've never seen an oyster drill up on the river. Are they just mainly in the bay? Yeah, um, I suspect they're more in saltier environments and you're, you're pretty far up there on the oyster, right? I'm not sure what your salinity is, but it's probably about half or at most, right, of yeah. Great Bay? Okay. Yeah. Excellent right. question. Yeah, so you have a little bit of um, salinity ref refuge, which is good. Another topic we've dived into, uh, literally, <laughs> is seagrass recovery. Uh, um, and we the group of other organizations, a big group, I won't need them all, so it'll just take a couple minutes. But we're sparked, um, we kind of came up with the state of science paper that summarizes Know, where we are and what the, um, the context of, of nutrient loading is and, and restoration. And one of the first things that it sparked um, is a, it's a site selection model. So there was one done uh, about 15 years ago by Fred Short at UNH and we're hoping it's to get redone. It's actually getting redone this year and hopefully um, early next year will be redone. And we'll take new data from eelgrass distribution to new water quality data and tell us where the best places in Great Bay to um, plant eelgrass will be. And one of the next steps, which we're hoping to do uh, next year, is to do pilot plantings, and also, of course, increase research. And I think this document that we worked on is, is sparking all those things, um, which is a great segue to, to the fellowship. And again, I'm just going really quickly because I don't want to go through too much time here. Um, but I will provide, you know, I'll be happy to stay on and answer as many questions you guys have. And I also have a, like a resource document with a couple of presentations that really dive into one of these individual topics. So um, if you're really interested in just one of these topics, I can point you to some resources for sure. So Anna has been doing some great work on nutrients and seagrasses, as you guys know, from last month. And um, I forget where I was going with this. Oh, she, so Anna, Corey, and I, and a bunch of, uh, local partners also just put in a proposal a couple of days ago, actually, and it kind of the gist of it is is the tipping point. What's the tipping point of nitrogen we can put in Great Bay that's going to um, reduce eelgrass? And I thought this was a clever way of doing that. Um, you could also flip that over and say, what's the tipping point of nutrient reductions that will increase eelgrass? Because eelgrass absorbs nutrients, it buries nutrients. It also improves sedimentation. So if you have a, enough eelgrass, um, you know, it'll engineer a better environment for itself. And we're hoping that gets funded, of course, because we want to keep Anna around as, as much as we can. Another emerging topic, as you guys may have heard, is uh, ocean acidification with all the carbon dioxide in the air, how much is going to the water. Um, we do pH monitoring for, for several decades, but we just started monitoring um, I think this month, I think it's in right now, um, 
P is called part, uh, partial pressure of CO2. So basically what's the amount of uh, this concentration of CO2 in the water, which will give us a more complete picture of what's going on before it's too late. If you just monitor pH, um, you're not monitoring the buffering capacity, things will change. Um, when things are detected to change with pH, it'll be kind of too late and, and your wildlife will be affected. So we're really trying to poise ourselves for the future to um, get better monitoring on ocean acidification. And we're, um, yeah, so this is actually splashed in Wells um, Harbor and they kind of pioneered this interesting cage design. Um, but it's basically just the sensor that logs um, continuous um, carbon dioxide in the water every, every 15 minutes. And lastly, I promised I'd get back into environmental DNA and um, I am. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a pretty interesting project because it's a collaboration between the reserve, um, fishing game at, at in Durham, uh, the Marine Division, and also UNH Genomics Center. And one of the applications that we were looking at is, can it be used um, to document the fish communities in Great Bay? Can it augment what we currently do? So we kind of matched it up with, with the seining that um, Green Division does every month um, with this 100 foot bag seines with eDNA, which is less fun than playing in the mud and playing with fish, but um, a little bit easier. So we went out there and collected water samples along with them or before them and um, brought it back to the lab and filtered, extracted, and sequenced. And um, this is kind of, this is an interesting way to present it. So there's Venn diagram. So the stuff in the middle between both circles has been captured by both eDNA and also just with the same net. And the stuff on the left side um, is just captured by eDNA. And these are larger fish that are usually more mobile, like striped bass or haddock. Um, and on the right there, and which we didn't catch with eDNA, but they caught in the seine, are some of them are um, smaller and rare and more bottom dwelling, like um, the sculpin and the pipefish. So generally speaking, we'd say that eDNA kind of favors um, so it does a pretty good job actually capturing the fish community, but it does favor more abundant fish. Um, and it's hard, sometimes it's harder to pick up on rare bottom dwelling uh, fish. And just to give you guys a little note, we did our sampling in the, in the, you know, the surface. So with you know, in, increased sampling and in sampling at depth, I'm sure we can pick those species up as well. Chris, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, how far out? In, are you just in Great Bay proper, or do you go into Little Bay? Like, how far downriver are you sampling? For for this specific project, yeah, um, we are matching it up with with fishing game. So they do one at the mouth of the oyster, one kind of like close to Hen Island, one at Fox Point. I think people know where these are, but they're kind of scattered about. Um, like one's kind of close to the Dover Marina. Okay. Uh, do you go beyond the General Sullivan Bridge? No, no. We um, okay. basically were like in Little Bay. I misspoke. Yeah. I, I, I meant to say the Newington Marina. What's, what's the Great Bay Marina? I think it's called. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. And then it yeah. It's, it's just interesting to see Haddock in that sample. So that's cool. Thank you. What's What's missing is bluefish. I've caught bluefish in the bay, yeah. up and down. None of that, Chris. Well, it's a you know. You don't, it might not capture everything. We didn't capture that even in the scene, of course, and that's hard to capture, but we're, we're doing this at the sites that the fishing game does, and they're doing it typically near the shore because they're, they're doing beach seining. Um, okay. As shown here, so. They're more shallow, yeah. Yeah, but I'm sure they're out there. So, Chris, can, is, can you quantify it from this, like a certain amount of DNA? Is there any quantifying or it's just identifying? You mean putting an abundance number on yeah, it? Like, or, or relative abundance, maybe. Yeah, so there's been some work on that. Um, right now, I'd say no, because if you get a whole bunch of sequences, it could be a whole bunch of fish getting, shedding like a scale, a couple of scales, or it could be one fish that was torn to shreds. So it's hard to differentiate between mm -hmm. those things. You can probably get at it with you know probability. If you just do enough sampling and you get abundance numbers and you, you can you can kind of get that variability and kind of tease it out. Um, but right now it's more focused and more better apical for presence absence. So is there a, is there a catalog or nationally or something that you 
that, that you match these DNAs to? Yeah, exactly. You can, uh, we use that and we can even add to it with local samples because, you know, some, you know, um, say striped bass are a different genetic structure than, than down, you know, in, in Massachusetts. So, yeah, it's a pretty interesting and in, in new field and there's a lot of developments here. Um, I didn't want to cut you off. You had another question, Peter. No, I, well, no, I'm listening. It's, it's interesting because I know that from work back in when I was younger, that we used to do a lot of work in uh, striped bass in the Hudson, and it was this whole thing about where the New England uh, striped bass were coming from, the Chesapeake or the Hudson. And yeah, so it would be interesting to know whether they can differentiate it. Maybe they probably can now. Yeah, so we can do different genotypes, um, and I'm presuming that there would be different genotypes for different regions. And in fact, I was talking to the um, professor at UNACE I've been working with. We can even, you know, sequence this fish over here, this one unique fish. You know, we caught a fish, and his name was Bob. We could track Bob throughout the estuary, so we can get down to that level. So it'd be, it's really advancing. It's really, really unique, novel field. Uh, Chris, if you had a graph, the quality of the water, would the graph be going up or down? Of Great Bay? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. You know, if you look, what are you look? Are you looking at nutrients? Are you looking at sedimentation? Are you looking at eelgrass? Um, you're looking at fish communities. I would say, not to dodge the question, I would say um, it was going down for a while and. Lately, it's been going up, but has it, has it reached the, where, it, where it was before we started polluting it a lot? Probably not. Um, this year was encouraging. We saw a lot more seagrasses, or seagrass abundance here, and that's encouraging. And there's been a lot of nutrient reduction, right? So I would say just with the caution and not with like really looking at the data too in depth that with the reductions of nutrient loading, that it is going up at a slow rate. And we're hoping that, you know, eelgrass, if eelgrass comes back, it can create that positive feedback mechanism where it even more filters the water and make, improves water quality. Due to improved uh, towns' sewage systems? Well, that is a big part of nutrient reduction, right? Was, was those upgrades um, to Newmarket, to Exeter, and then some more minor upgrades to the Dover and Portsmouth and Rochester. Yeah, one of my um one of my professors in college used to say, like, you, you can use Great Bay for many different things. And what's the primary purpose we use Great Bay? And we use it as uh, a place to dump our, our waste, unfortunately. That's the primary thing, but hopefully that's changing, you know. Um I did want to kind of throw out one more thing with this eDNA tool is, so we're looking at fish populations, but you can kind of, you can sequence anything. And if you take, take a very general primer, which is a way to identify the DNA in the, in the water column, you can just do a total biodiversity um, measurement. And that'd be really interesting to see how Great Bay might be shifting in the future because of nutrient reductions or climate change. And, we have two years of data and I'm hoping to keep this program going just to really track you know, fish communities, invasive species, rare species, but also just total you know, general biodiversity. So I'm excited about you know, implementing eDNA over the long term here. Chris, is it expensive to do a sample? Um, what did we do? Uh, we, did, we did four sites or we did a, four water quality sites this year and we did nine um, habitat sites with three. So that's four times nine is 36 times three. So let's look at over a hundred samples. I think it was about $3,000 if you do the field work and you do the filtration on your own. So what is that? That's about like under $30 a sample. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'll jump in here because I want to remind the stewards that that three thousand dollars came from Gibner support. So a lot of this eDNA work was started through a three-year grant that Chris was a part of with Allison Watts and a lot of researchers from around the country and at UNH. And 
we decided that this could be so cool that we should try to keep it going. And it's not really that expensive, as Chris said, if we're doing a lot of the work ourselves, but that um, the analysis piece we didn't have in our budget. So um, a lot of what Chris is presenting and our hope for being able to continue this in the future is largely in part because of the stewards being able to invest this year in the, uh, the analysis work. So thank you. So, uh, Chris, are, are you involved? Is this going to be continuing in? The, I assume you're involved in the prep monitoring upgrade or the, the program where they're looking at the new monitoring program for Great Bay, right? For salt marshes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So is that, is, are you going to try to incorporate eDNA in that? Is that one of the... Um, with their with their salt marsh monitoring, it's mostly just um, it's Great Bay and Nature Conservancy that kind of contribute there, and and they you know they look at all of the the resources and stuff. But uh, I there's a lot of different there's a lot of priorities on the list for monitoring and research in Great Bay. I brought up EDNA. It doesn't seem like it's holding too much traction at that level because uh, there's so many other needs, um, but it's definitely a priority for me, for other reserves as well. And are hoping to do, create like a national program where we create this module. It's like, if you're interested in doing this, maybe you could get some help from, you know, Chris here or Jason at, at Wells Reserve. They can help um, bring this, this new method to your reserve. And really cool to have this, you know, throughout the reserve system, at least I think. I think some, I think Dennis. Dennis, yeah, Dennis has to stand up. up, yeah. Dennis Molloy, do you have yep, a question? Yep, yep, I do. Um, I'm on a um, Seacoast uh, commission uh, that's looking at uh, rewriting some of the uh, uh, rules for uh, septic systems, uh, private septic systems and uh uh we're going to be presenting that to the to the legislature this uh spring if we have a session um and i'm i want to know a little bit more about point versus non-point pollution i've never really brought this up in any of our meetings before because we've been talking about other things and i don't know where the best place would be to talk about this. Um, I mean, I know we have the towns and cities that are point, and then we have all this other non-point stuff. Uh, my, my, my question to you is, if we, we, we have a lot of septic systems in the area that have been grandfathered in, anything before 1978 or 75 or something like that, they they don't have it to have any uh, restrictions or requirements or any anything to be done to them unless there's a new house a new new construction a new zoning thing and uh, then the thing gets uh, fixed at that time these are residential things primarily uh, what is the uh, what 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 where is most of this coming from and if it's improving are we seeing that improvement from the towns in their systems or when we put in new private septic systems is that is that improving it's a broad question but i just at some point i'd like to talk about that because i need a little bit more information about it sure yeah it's a it's a broad question it's an important question and it's a the nuance question. So yeah, I right, all of that. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, that's that's why I'm kind of struggling with all of it. <laughs> yeah, I would say that. I Good would, answer. <laughs> I'd say that I'd like to jump into it at depth, and if you want to have a side conversation with me, and I'd yeah. also probably want to bring Corey because she's been dealing with this a lot longer than I have. Yeah, maybe this is a for another place and an offline thing, and that's fine. That'd yeah. be great. I'd love to do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just like broadly speaking, you know, if you're looking at management in Great Bay, you look at what's the best way to reduce it. And usually the best way to reduce it is the biggest sources, and that's through the towns. Yeah. Um, and there's non-point stuff that you mentioned. There's also like atmospheric deposition. So uh, I will leave it at that because I could, I, I could talk yeah. about this and Corey could talk about this for a long time. Um, I, I, a really I, just good wanted, 
I just wanted to put that out there so somebody can talk to me about this sometime and then we can deal with it in another spot. Yeah, I think you should, we should follow up for sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oops. Dang, I'm getting dinged out of here. Um, how are people feeling? I think it's, holy smokes, it's 35 minutes in. Um, I, I have like three slides left, but I won't torture you if you guys are, if you guys don't want to stay that long. No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> All right, I'll go like quickly. So I, I promise that I get back to this. This is kind of the, one of the topics that Great Bay has been digging in on. So our salt marsh is keeping pace with sea level rise. And we've been monitoring this for 10 years um, at Great Bay and, and throughout the, the country, actually. And we dug in in New England, so four reserves, eight marshes, eight years of data, uh, over 30,000 data points, 180 species. And we're asking this question with the data set. And we, we looked at it for um, it's like about a year and a half project. And I could really jump in and give you some fancy scientific graphs. I mean, this, this non-metric multi-dimension scaling graph on the bottom right would take me 10 minutes just to explain what it is. But I think the most, <laughs> the most important thing visual I can show you is, um, is cartoons, I guess. I forgot to put that up. Um, in a time series of a plot in Rhode Island going from completely vegetated to almost completely unvegetated in five years. Wow. And the overall summary is that New England in New England marshes are changing. Um, in the low marsh, we're losing our logoed grass, Spartine alternoflora, smooth cord grass, and it's getting replaced by non-living co cover. <laughs> well, like color, that's, I think that was a show I used to watch. Um, and that's water, bare ground, and, and dead plants. Um, and the high marsh is looking more like the low marsh. If you imagine flooding increasing, um, these things are moving upwards. And in, in southern New England, the high marshes really don't even exist there much at all because they're just mostly low marsh and the lower edge of the low marsh is kind of drowning. So it's, it's kind of discouraging um, to see it, but we've been monitoring and tracking it. So that's the first step is to identify the problem. And then we have these interesting restoration tools and one that I just pointed out earlier. Um, one of the cool things is we wrote a proposal, Great Bay Letter a proposal and it was funded and it starts this February to take this work at that next national levels. So we get 21 reserves that are going to dig in on this and we're looking at this problem across the country because you know things may change by region. There's different, you know, much different tides across the country. You know, we have up to like 50 foot tides in the Bay of Fundy. Some places are two feet. In Alaska, the continental rebound is, is making the, the marshes actually rise faster than the ocean. So they're actually gaining marsh. So it's all kind of crazy. Um, and with that craziness, I'll just end it there and and if you guys have more questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Chris, I think I read um, in a paper that uh, your group had identified Tricky Point and a place over in Kittery, I think, is the best place to restore seagrass for a potential um, experimental project to see about how the transplanting would work. Or is this something that you know, you say you're still working to identify the places where you're going to do this. So I kind of thought they had been chosen. Well, kudos for reading that report. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So at the time, which was, I think, uh, I think it was finalized in December. No, wait, I can't remember. But it was, it might have been like six to eight months ago that we actually got the report out. Mm. But anyways, um, at the time, we, we were trying to base it off the best available information. We have this model that was run in the early 2000s, and then we have expert data, which we, looked, we talked to seagrass ecologists, um, Fred Short and Dave Burdick, and asked them, and they came up with that list based on that. Of okay. course, the best available information at the time is not great, and we want to update that. And that's what's being worked on right now, actually, by um, a professor at BU and a uh, uh, post postdoc at UNH are, are tackling that right now, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when would, do you think you'll have those points identified and you'll have the crews in there um, doing some transplanting or planting? Uh, well, last, well, last I heard, we're hoping to get that model rerun, um, which will be, I think, early 2021. So like, you know, February, March, and then if things aren't as chaotic as this year, we're hoping to do some pilot restorations um, 
with UNH and PrEP, uh, just at those sites that are, are most viable or predicted to be most viable. Yeah. yeah. Well, let us know if you need help. Probably there'll I'll be a few board members that'll show up. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Get my mud boots. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. And does anybody have any?